Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 who never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who's in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Guys, the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. That word want in the Hebrew, in the original language that it was written in, is the Hebrew word kosher. And what that means is, it means to be in need, to lack, to not have enough. And so when we read in Psalm chapter 23, verse 1, where it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What he's saying is, is, I am the good shepherd, and I will give you everything that you need. It means that even though sometimes when the world feels like it's caving in around you, when it's falling apart around you, you need need to remember exactly who God is. He is our good shepherd. So stop worrying about today. Stop worrying about tomorrow. Stop worrying about next week, next month, next year. Stop worrying about your children. Stop worrying about your parents. Stop worrying about your spouse or your job or the finances. Stop worrying. Stop. He, he, he is the good shepherd. We shall not want. He has you. He has you. What I love about Scripture, literally all of Scripture, but especially in Psalm 23, is we see the transition. We see what happens before God and then what happens with God. We see where we once were and where we are. We see where darkness leads us and where light leads us. We see it all throughout Scripture. And what I love about God is that He lays everything out on the table. His cards are just laid out. He's a horrible poker player because he just lays it all out there. You know, you see every card that he has, and he says, this is exactly what's going to happen to you if you follow me. And this is what will happen if you don't. He lays it all out before us. Cards are on the table. It's not a secret. And in Psalm 23, verse 2, he says, it, it continues, so the Lord is my shepherd, we shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. Let me remind you of something this morning. This morning, somebody in here needs a reminder that you were not meant to work your fingers to the bone for 65 years to only retire with 10 years left until you die. That is not what God has intended for you. That is not the purpose that God has for your life. God has a purpose for you. He has a mission for you. Do you believe that this morning? God has designed you to rest in Him, to live in Him, to allow Him to speak to you. In fact, He built it into the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He commands us to rest. Jesus lived it by example. He removed himself from the crowds. He removed himself from ministry. He removed himself from the stress. And he went off by himself to pray. He needed to rest. And then we see it in Psalm 23. It's something that we as Americans often tend to forget. God has called us to rest. He makes us Lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I want you to understand that God calls us to rest today. Rest from the worry, rest from the fear, rest from your work, rest from the toil, rest, rest. God calls us to rest. I'm not talking about just camping or fishing, although those things are great. And sometimes they can restore the soul. But what I'm talking about is a spiritual rest where you lay your burdens down before God and you say, I can't do this on my own anymore. And you allow God to lead you to the green pastures, 
and the still waters. What is the green pasture? It's nourishment for the soul. It's the Word of God, which fills our heart, feeds our soul. I missed mowing my lawn for like three weeks. Don't tell anybody. (laughs) And you know what happened is a bunch of deer started bedding in my backyard. (laughs) It's because the grass was like up to your calves. And it's because in that tall grass, in that meadow, in that green pasture, there's life, there's nourishment, there's comfort, there's safety, there's security. That's why we're meant to lay there. We're meant to rest, guys. But the scripture says he also leads us by still waters. It's interesting that he chooses a still water, not a rushing river. The rushing river has power. But a still water, it's deep. It's peaceful. It's beautiful. A river can sweep sheep away, scare them because of the noise still waters, though. It's a place where they stay. Charles Spurgeon once said, he says, still water runs deep. Nothing more noisy than an empty drum. That silence is golden, indeed, in which the Holy Spirit meets with the souls of saints, not to raging waves of strife, but to peaceful streams of holy love does the Spirit of God conduct the chosen sheep. He is a dove, not an eagle. The dew not the hurricane. Our Lord leads us beside these still waters. We couldn't get there by ourselves. We need his guidance. Therefore, it says, he leadeth me. He doesn't drive us. Moses drives us by the law, but Jesus leads us by his example and the gentle drawing of his love. You see, when we recognize that the Lord is our good shepherd, our rescuer, our provider, our savior, and we allow ourselves to rest in that truth and to be led by the depths of his goodness through his word, through his presence. The progression continues on to verse 3. He says, he restores my soul. Is there anybody in here today that could use a little restoring of your soul? Maybe you have a feeling like, God, I just want to connect with you. I just need to feel you again, God. I need to feel whole again. I need to feel the love of God again. I just want to feel myself again. I need to feel the closeness of God again. Then let me tell you something today. Let go. Let go. Let go. Let go of your constantly trying to worry and make things happen and control situations and circumstances, just let go. Let go of your fear. Let go of your worry. Let go of your anxiety. Just let go and rest. As you embrace God and His goodness through His Word, through His presence, I'm telling you, your soul will be restored. And what's what's most amazing is is that once we've received that rest and we've stepped into it and we allow the restoring nature of God's goodness to come inside of us, the natural progression is then that we begin to reflect the very nature and character of the God who is restoring us. So the scripture continues and it says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. As being in ministry is not easy. It's not an easy job to be a pastor. And yes, I do work more than just Sunday, I promise you. (laughs) In fact, anybody who's been in any sort of leadership position at all can understand that you're always going to have critics. Heck, even moms, dads, anybody. You're always going to have critics. You're going to have people who think that you're not doing it right, people who think that you could be doing it better, and you know what's amazing is they're probably right. You could be doing it better. It is what it is. But I can remember 
There was a season in my life where I was giving in to these thoughts and giving in to these people, and I can remember going home at night not being able to sleep because I was constantly thinking, what could I be doing better? How could I be doing this? How could I please people better? How can I make this run better? What can I do to make this better? You guys ever been there before? You can't sleep because you're constantly, your mind just won't stop. Something amazing happens, Will, when you realize you're not in control. <laughs> in fact, you were never intended to be in control. You're not supposed to be in control. In fact, when you try and take control of every circumstance and every season and every situation of your life, what you're doing is you're trying to take the reins from God. Stop. What happens when you just let go and allow the Good Shepherd to make you rest, to lead you by those still waters and that green pasture, and you begin to reflect His nature and His character? What happens is, even though you are walking through the valleys of the shadow of death, you're walking through the valleys of life, and you will walk through valleys throughout your entire life, what happens is, when you walk through those valleys, is a beautiful thing, because verse 4 continues, and it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When we walk through the valley, fear has no place in our life if we've rested in the goodness of God. In fact, the very thing that God uses to protect us is the very thing, his, the rod and the staff is the very thing that brings us comfort and peace. Because we know that God is good, that He is our protector, that He's our Savior, that His plans for you are good and true. And then it provides some of the most beautifully beautiful imagery that I could ever imagine. If I was an artist, I would paint this. But it goes on and it continues. It says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And my cup overflows. Guys, in our house, in our home, in the Blanchard house, the table, that's where we pour our hearts out. It's where we share with one another our day, the successes, the failures, the hurts, the joy, what was good, what was bad. It's where we eat together, we laugh together, we cry together, we play games together at the table. We share love together, we build memories together. And it's a continual discovery at the table of the depth of our love for one another. And it's because the table is a symbol of intimacy. The table is a symbol of family. The table is a symbol of relationship. And God promises that in the presence of our enemies, He sets a table before us. In other words, no matter what you go through in your life, no matter where you may find yourself, no matter what difficult season you may be going through, whether it be a season of immense loneliness and pain or a season of joy, even in the midst of heartache, He not only invites us to the table, He's already prepared a place for you. He has prepared a place for you. And it's at that table having gone through the valley of the shadow of death and knowing that we will go through it again, that God says, come, get to know me, be with me. And as we sit there, he says that he anoints our head with oil and that our cup overflows. And you know that, ble that God's blessing in your life, God's promises in your life, they're eternal. They're not temporary. They're not seasonal. They're not partial. They are eternal. And He anoints us with His goodness so that what we experience, the goodness that we experience through God, the love that we experience through God, the blessing that we experience through God flows out from us to the world around us. And we become a change in this world. And that's ultimately what this is all about, knowing God and making Him known. And then lastly, He gives us two promises. 
He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Two promises. One is earthly. The other is eternal. Those who lean on him, who rest in him, who sit in his blessing at his table without fear of the enemy, without fear of the world, knowing that their victory is in Jesus, knowing that God's blessing over you is not momentary but eternal, allowing his goodness, that's the message of the gospel, to flow from you to the world. God says that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And he says, and your eternal reward is that you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're still going to go through valleys. You're still going to go through difficult seasons. You're still going to have challenges in your life. But in the next valley you go through, you'll know that God is with you, that he's leading you, that you'll have peace in the middle of it. When it feels like the world could fall apart around you, you, held it, you've, you hold it together because of God's goodness. Guys, I know that this season hasn't been easy. And I'm so thankful that we're here today. But what I want you to do is allow the Prince of Peace to give you peace today. Trust him. Because he's good. And his promises are true. We're going to end a little differently today. Today we're going to take communion together. We're going to remember God's goodness. We're going to remember everything that Jesus did for us. And so Tom is going to walk around and pass out the, the communion. And I know that this is not our normal communion. It's those weird wafers, but it's all right. Symbolically, though, we're going to remember God's goodness. So once you guys go ahead and receive the elements as Tom passes them around. Hey, Tom, can I grab one of those too? Thank you. Blake, would you mind putting the whole Psalm 23 back up on the screen for me? I think it was the first slide. Let's read this together, guys. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for You are with me. Your rod and Your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember, Jesus is the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? He lays down his life for the sheep. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember his body was broken for us. After supper, and Jesus took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. It was shed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember that we have forgiveness of sin the shed blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the good shepherd. Lord, that you willingly lay down your life for us. And Lord, I thank you that for those who call on your name, your people, for all of us, you are our good shepherd. That there is no scheme of the enemy that is greater than the goodness of God. That for anyone who calls on your name, the name of Jesus, there's forgiveness of sin, there's hope, there's joy, there's peace in the middle of these crazy circumstances. Lord, help us to remember that you're not just the shepherd, you're the good shepherd. Help us to remember your promises that you protect us, that you lead us, that you guide us, that you prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies and that goodness and mercy follow us forever. And Lord, help us to remember that no difficulty in this life can ever compare to the goodness that's waiting for us in eternity. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, have an amazing week of worship. And remember, allow the goodness of God to flow through you and to change the world around you. That's what it's about. Changing lives with God's love. You guys have an awesome week of worship. If you need prayer, I would love to pray with you. For everybody else, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.